Welcome to this masterclass on the role of GCs in business planning and with particular reference to Brexit risk management and implementation of legal changes for Brexit. My name is Bruce Macmillan and after 17 years as an in-house lawyer, I now run a team called the Centre for Legal Leadership, which helps in-house lawyers to manage their roles, their careers, their teams and their engagement with wider business management. We do this through a combination of free-to-air website resources, many of which are worked with in conjunction with practical law, through setting up and running trade discussion groups, again often in conjunction with practical law, and through providing a range of recruitment, mentoring, coaching and management consulting services to law departments and to the individuals within them. I'm here today to talk about the important role that General Counsel will play in managing the Brexit risks and regulatory changes for their businesses over the coming decade or so, during which Brexit risk management will become a key part of most businesses' activities and also to focus on some of the key aspects that you'll need to address in building and managing your legal team resource to meet the business's needs effectively over that period. I'm using Brexit as an illustration of the importance of the role of the GC in business strategy because Brexit is going to be such an important and all-pervasive aspect of our corporate roles and our personal lives probably for at least the next decade. Illustratively, uh, in recent weeks preceding this recording, the Financial Times has published an analysis indicating that there are about 750 international treaties that will need to be negotiated by the UK in order simply to replace the arrangements that are already in place under the EU, both with the EU and internationally. And of those, in excess of 600 have specific business or commercial application to most of the businesses in the UK. Within the domestic arena, the Institute for Government has also published a report which indicates that uh, up to about 21 pieces of primary legislation will be needed in order to fully implement the knock-on effects of the Repeal Bill. The Repeal Bill is the proposed piece of legislation to clone EU law into UK law and then adapt it following Brexit. And this extra legislation will be required principally to create within the UK some of the institutions that are currently performing functions in the European Union and affecting us. For context, that 21 pieces of legislation is approximately equivalent to the entire parliamentary lawmaking capacity of the UK Parliament per year. A lot of people think that because their business appears to be entirely domestic, uh, this will not affect them very much, but that isn't correct. Uh, illustratively, if you drunk a glass of water this morning, or even a cup of coffee or tea, just think, how much law did you drink in that gulp? And how much of that law was national law? And how much of it was EU law, for example, on water safety, water quality, the health and safety environment through which the water came through the pipes in your office, and even up to the level of European competition law regulation on water utilities, which are local monopolies. And then think about how much of that law that you drank was international treaties but negotiated by the EU. For example, product safety definitions and quality definitions around the tea or coffee, import or export duties, international trade treaties to allow the goods to be shipped here in the first place. So if you think about all of those things, you'll start to see that uh, the changes uh, that will come with Brexit are all pervasive and touch a lot of businesses both directly through the people they buy from and sell to and their employees and staff and also indirectly through the people who those companies themselves buy from and sell to. If you think about the device that you're watching this webinar from, for example, where was it made and how did it get to you? So you can start to see that in all of these spaces there'll be a material enduring and important impact on all companies from the Brexit environment. In addition, the other factor of course to take account of is that the whole point for many people about voting leave was to, quote, take back control of our national legislative and uh, regulatory agenda and our international trade treaties. So it's not just that uh, things will be different, it's also that those things will uh, change more over time, there'll be more divergence. And it may well be fair to assume that in some senses the repeal bill will mean small changes to things. For example, the commitment made already to the general data protection regulations that similar principles will still be maintained within UK law. However, having similar principles is not the same as an agreement to be able to transport data still between the EU and the UK. And if you think that these things are principally about EU-UK relationships, that's also not correct. Because the majority of the relationships that the UK has had negotiated for it 
uh, over the last 40 years with international trading organisations are um, and bodies are done by the EU. So with the exit from the EU, all of these things will have to be renegotiated from scratch. So it genuinely is the case that if your business does anything directly or indirectly with anywhere other than the UK, it will be affected. As with any business problem, it's never just a business problem because business has law all the way through it in terms of not just the contracts but the laws and the regulations. It's as all-pervasive within a business to have legal regulation as it is to have legal regulation in the water that we talked about a few seconds ago. So when you're looking at what the business does and how it does it, you need to think about how law and regulation is a core component of the business's strategy and functions and how it plans its future. Because, after all, things like the cost of workers, the location of your staff, cost and supply of goods, taxes and so on, are important factors in how you operate, but so is the laws and regulations that affect your business. And when there are major changes in any of those factors, including law and regulation, especially ones which are of uncertain duration and uncertain impact and size, then the impact of those legal changes can be very material on your business's future plans, affecting its costs, affecting its locations, affecting what it sells and where it sells it, and even potentially affecting the financial viability of the business as a whole. In order to address these things, most businesses plan ahead. And business planning, broadly speaking, is the process through which businesses look at all of the factors that impact them, the types of things that I've just mentioned in terms of uh, the people, the staffing, the customer base, the economic conditions, taxes, tariffs, availability of access to products and services to buy and things to sell, and also the legal and regulatory environment in which they do it. And this builds up a, a business ecosystem, business environment, which they can then analyse. And they can then work out how, within that business ecosystem, their business plans and projects will work. And good businesses then carry on, having designed their business plans and projects in that business ecosystem, to monitor changes in the system, as well as their own performance, and course correct and improve things as they go along, so that they're continually adapting to the environment uh, and the challenges that they face. Many people think that their businesses don't plan ahead, but this is incorrect. All businesses plan ahead. The real question is how explicit it is and how much it's based on assumptions. You know, how good the quality of the planning is, how forward-looking it is, how explicit it is, how inclusive it is. A you know, challenge for in-house lawyers is often that they aren't really engaged in these processes, so they're not really conscious of what's going on. But if you want a couple of illustrations of how businesses plan ahead explicitly, or as by assumption, think about when the next lease break clause on the property is that you're in at present. Think about what the length of the next, uh, the biggest contractual arrangement you have with suppliers is. Think about the duration of your um, customer contracts. And critically, because this is often one of the most important determinants in management mindset in reality, think about how long the current incentive and option plans uh, for your staff and senior management run for, because those are really indicators of how far ahead they're planning. And of course, if any of those, or all of those, run past March 2019, then you have a Brexit planning problem right now. So legal horizon scanning uh, is an important component of how the law department should be interacting with its business generally, and in particular in the context of Brexit. Because, as we've just touched on, all businesses plan ahead to some level. They have to, because they have to make forward-looking commitments in various forms, both in terms of what their assumptions about income and costs are, and in terms of the relationships that they build and maintain. And so, a legal function needs to look out over that same forward horizon to understand what legal and regulatory implications, both contractual and in terms of change of law, will occur over that period, and use those to help inform the business so that it can think about how those things change its plans, change the strategy, change the cost base of what they do, and also to make provision for the level of legal resource and support that will be needed for that delivery. And in that context, the Brexit environment, where so much of the change that's coming through in the next few years will be legal or regulatory driven, and so much of that will be so material to what businesses can do, means that it's ever more important for businesses uh, for legal functions of businesses to engage with those businesses properly and early to help model and scope those changes as soon as they can 
to help the business plan and correct its plans accordingly. The annual budget and financial cycle is one of the um, most important parts of a business's forward planning and business planning activity, and one that many law functions don't properly understand and engage with. The critical point about this process is that it typically happens between two and six months before the start of the financial year to which it relates, and in fact in bigger organisations it may start earlier than that. And as a legal function, like any other function in the business that uh, has an impact on the business ecosystem that we touched on earlier, it's really important that you help inform those other business units and plan yourself for things that you are aware of that will or may impact on the business during that next financial year, at the time when it's early enough to do something about it, which is at the time when those departments are thinking about their plans, thinking about their revenue, thinking about their costs, thinking about the factors that will affect them. Because if you can help them to identify actual or potential material concerns now that may affect them next year, then at least they can plan for those and build them in and be able to respond accordingly, rather than being caught out and surprised by them if you bring things to their attention only next year when they actually come into force, uh, which would create a problem for them and for you. And Brexit makes us even more important for two key reasons. The first one is that uh, there is no business at the moment which has more than one complete financial year before March 19, before the Brexit commencement date, if you like. And because of this, all businesses in the next two to nine months will be uh, having to go through the last financial planning cycle that they go through before Brexit kicks in. And within that financial planning approach, they need to work out how they're going to respond next financial year to be ready in time for Brexit in March 2019, whatever that may bring with it. The second thing which is tied to this is that for most organisations, um, it's important to be ready by Brexit date for what you think will happen with Brexit. And this means taking decisions and implementing them probably before you're absolutely sure what you, that you know what will be going on in future. In many ways, this is a little bit like what your business may already do in terms of buying foreign currency ahead in order to provide exchange rate certainty. Hindsight may prove that the uh, price that you've got is slightly wrong or that things have turned out differently, but at least you've got operational certainty to work with. And in this context, um, the most important thing, particularly for lawyers, because the most likely impacts are regulatory and, and legal in nature, is to work out how long you have got before you have to make a decision in order to be ready for Brexit in March 2019. And so many businesses are looking at what the longest lead time things are that will need to be changed in order to work out how late they can leave it before making a decision and then making those changes and still being ready for March 2019. Illustratively, in the financial services sector, many organisations have worked out already that uh, the longest lead time items include things like applying for regulatory licences in Europe in order to move parts of their business into the core Europe. And as a result of that, they've had to make decisions as early as the start of 2017, i.e. some months ago, in order to be able to implement and be ready in time. So, with your business, it's very important to work out what the legal and regulatory factors are, whether they be lease break clauses, changing operations of organisations, changing in supply or, or customer models, or regulatory licensing, which are likely to be the longest lead time items, and how long in this time of extra pressure on those regulators and other things it will take to do those things, because that will then help you to inform your business about the date by which it must make decisions in order to be capable of definitely being ready for Brexit in March 2019. Of course, all of this work to help prepare and understand what's going on and then to implement change, whether it be reviewing your contracts, working out what the break clauses are, whether there'll be a force majeure impact on you, whether your suppliers or customers are going to break the contract on you rather than you breaking it on them, and that's obviously a predictable thing, so don't get caught out. All of these things involve a lot of work. And the type of work involved, both in terms of volume and in terms of character, whether it be horizon scanning, understanding administrative law, looking at some of the legislative provisions which underpin what you do, 
health and safety law, premises law, tariffs and duties on products you import and export and so on. All of these things are very different from perhaps what you're doing as run rate. And that means that the resources you need, both within your team and from your suppliers, your legal advisors, may be different from what you have now. And this means that it's particularly important to work out early what you will need as a function in order to be able to definitely deliver adequately for your business next year and to co-opt in your colleagues in IDD finance, procurement, HR, risk, to help you to understand and build a plan and get management acceptance of why next year and the years after may be different from what you've done to date for legal as well, so that you can get the support for the resourcing that you need in time to get it in place and therefore to be able to deliver effectively for your business.